with you guys. Yes. Welcome back for day five, part two. Um, day five, part two, uh, unit nine, ecology. Um, so we're going to pick back up with the three pieces of evidence um, at the end of the DDT article and uh, then go on with uh, bioaccumulation, biomagnification, and the beaks of finches. Um, so uh, this is a lot of different content, which is kind of why I broke it up into two parts. Although uh, in the other video, I didn't have an outro, so sorry uh, to those of you who saw that. Let's go ahead and get started. So. We left off right here with the DDT story. So uh, DDT is a pesticide um, we talked about in the last video um, and uh, it was causing uh, environmental impacts, right? And that we know is going to happen when the biodiversity of an ecosystem is impacted by the removal of certain organisms um, for example, like the use of pesticides to remove uh, different bugs and insects. So um, for the DDT story, you are to choose three pieces of evidence that either agree or disagree. So let's see. The article states that some groups in Africa are promoting DDT or nothing. So if you recall from the article, and you may want to go ahead and pull that up, um, DDT is a highly effective pesticide against mosquitoes. However, um, it is a uh, resistant to uh, destruction and as a result stays in the environment, stays in the ecosystem when it's sprayed as a pesticide. And you might recall um, from what we looked at yesterday uh, that there is a massive amount of uh, DDT still in products like heavy cream and milk that are produced in the United States, even though DDT has been banned 40 years ago. And that's because it's so persistent in the environment that it stays around. And we're going to talk more about that issue um, right coming up next with uh, biomagnification. So, um, so DDT or nothing. So we talked yesterday about why certain groups promote DDT. Is it because DDT is actually the most effective pesticide? Sadly, no. It's because DDT is made by companies that make money off of the production of DDT. And uh, there are, uh, it's a cheap chemical to use for agricultural practices, and it is an effective pesticide at killing everything. Of course, the issue is that it kills everything so well that it harms the people and other animals that go and consume those products. Uh, so, uh, as you can tell my opinion, let's go through the three pieces of evidence for why I disagree with these groups. Um, so again, the article states that some groups in Africa are promoting DDT or nothing in order to control its malaria carrying mosquito population. Do you agree or disagree with the groups in Africa? Find three pieces of evidence to support your opinion. So the article said that um, in Africa, uh, malaria is a very serious problem, a more serious problem than DDT accumulation, perhaps, and um, millions of children die every year of malaria. So getting rid of mosquitoes is not a joke in Africa, right? It is not just uh, something annoying. It is life or death. So there is, you know, a reason why people might support DDT. But again, let's go through this. DDT is not the most effective way to manage malaria in Africa. In the text, it says, on the ground evidence from around the world that more effective approaches are saving lives without putting communities in harm's way from exposure to the long lasting chemical. So there are different things that you can use that are not DDT that are going to be perhaps even more effective and they're not going to have this detrimental environmental impact. Um, not just on the consumers of uh, the eventual products that are sold, the humans, but also on all of the other animals in the ecosystem. So chemicals like DDT that are persistent in the environment that continue up the food chain, the concept we're about to cover, uh, are very hazardous for this reason. Um, so again, DDT has significant environmental impact. For example, thinning the shells of birds. There was evidence linking DDT with severe declines in bald eagle populations due to thinning eggshells. So the eggshell in a bird, I don't know if you guys know the term for this, is the amniote, right? It, in fact, birds and reptiles can lay their eggs on land because they have hard amniotes, right? And humans, you might be thinking, hmm, that reminds me of something that we talked about when we were talking about reproduction, the amniotic sac that the baby develops in. So if this chemical DDT was thinning eggshells and resulting in 
bald eagle population decline? What could it be doing to the amniotic sacs of mammals, including humans? Something that is an actual legitimate question, right? And not directly gone into in the article, but if it's affecting the amnio, that is a very serious uh, effect for reproduction. Now, this is what I was discussing and we're about to go further into. DDT bioaccumulates builds up inside the body, in the bodies of organisms, which results in DDT contamination of food and water even 40 years after DDT use was banned in the US. The USDA found DDT breakdown products in 60% of heavy cream samples, 42% of kale greens, 28% of carrots, and lower percentages in many other foods. This stuff sticks around in the environment. All right, so now, this concept, bioaccumulation, so this is the increase in pollutant concentration in one organism over a lifetime. So when uh, an organism, uh, for example, let's say a fish in a lake that might be contaminated, let's say with some DDT, is born, um, it may have a small amount of contamination, but if it stays in that contaminated river or lake its entire life, eventually over time, the bioaccumulation of DDT will be higher in that fish. But Bioaccumulation is just one problem. The real issue for us as humans is biomagnification. So as you can see here, it says an increase in pollutant concentration through the food chain. Well, what does that mean? So down here at the bottom of the food chain, the phytoplankton are being contaminated with DDT. It is in the environment. It is in the water. The phytoplankton are being contaminated with it. The zooplankton that eat the phytoplankton are then contaminated with the DDT, again, by eating the phytoplankton and also maybe in their own environment. Then the fish that eat the zooplankton are contaminated with DDT in their own environment. And now all the DDT that was consumed on the two prior levels of the food chain, are you getting this? So then when it comes to mammals, some things that we eat, right? Cows are mammals, uh, sheep, uh, pigs, chickens are not mammals, but chickens could be included maybe here between fish and mammals, right? So once you get to the higher level consumers, once you get to the apex predators, uh, and you know, humans, we don't usually call ourselves an apex predator, but we obviously, you know, consume everything below us on the food chain. Uh, we are getting all of the biomagnification of all of the levels of the food chain that consumed this organism before us. And all levels are affected by environmental impact, right? DDT, direct DDT exposure in the environment, but the top predator mammals and every level going up the food chain is affected, every level going up the trophic pyramid is affected by this biomagnification. So why does the animal at the top of the food chain have the most poison? Why does it have the biggest effect? When organisms in the higher food chain consume the organisms containing the toxins below their trophic levels, the toxins gradually become concentrated in the higher food chain. Because this is a repetitive process in the ecosystem and throughout the entire food chain, the higher organisms are the ones that will accumulate most of the toxins, right? So every time something eats something else, it's getting its previous exposure to whatever chemical. You know, it could be DDT, it could be other environmental toxins, but as it travels up the food chain, especially with something so persistent like DDT and also something like maybe Teflon that is very persistent in uh, the water supply in places like the United States and the developed world, this biomagnification happens throughout the food chain. So it is a magnification of concentration of DDT. You can see here in this image. So the fish eating birds are here at the top in this pyramid. And you can see the water itself is the first level. It is itself directly polluted with DDT. And what does that mean? All of these things theoretically live in the water, right? So everything in this pyramid is getting direct DDT exposure and also secondary tertiary uh, exposure by the levels of the food pyramid below, or excuse me, the trophic pyramid or uh, the food chain below. So why does this organism, the one at the bottom here, so in this case, uh, the producers, not have the effect of the poison? 
So the lower organisms in the food chain are directly consuming the contaminants because higher level consumers like humans consume so many contaminated animals and plants that the level of toxins are much higher by that point, right? So by that point, you're getting a magnified concentration of DDT. Uh, your parts per million are much higher as compared to the producers that are only getting that direct exposure, right? They are not eating anything that is contaminated. Although they might, they, if they are uh, crops, they may be getting pesticides sprayed directly on them. But again, that's direct exposure. So biomagnification. So why do we call this action biomagnification and why do we represent it with an upside down triangle? The process of biomagnification results in high levels of toxins such as DDT and higher level consumers. This is represented by an upside down triangle because the lower level consumers all individually consume small amounts of toxin and the higher order animals consume all the toxin their prey and its food already consumed right as it moves up the food chain. When organisms in the higher food chain consume the organisms containing the toxins below their trophic levels, the toxins gradually become concentrated in the higher food chain. Because this is a repetitive process in the ecosystem and throughout the entire food chain, the higher organisms are the ones that will accumulate most of the toxins. So as it goes up, biomagnification gets bigger as it goes up, right? And that magnification, like a magnifying glass, makes things bigger. All right. So... And again, so this term bioaccumulation is not as important, right? The key concept is biomagnification, but you may hear that term as well, right? So bioaccumulation is the increase in concentration of a pollutant in an individual organism. So that could even happen in a human, right? When you're a child, maybe you're exposed to a small amount of DDT. And then as an adult, you get a job working on a farm and you're spraying pesticides and you spray DDT and you continue to be exposed. You're getting a higher bioaccumulation of a chemical in your body compared to the biomagnification, which is the increase in concentration of a pollutant in a food chain, right? So we start here with a lower level, maybe this is plankton, going all the way up now to the bald eagle, and the concentration of contaminants gets higher as we go up the food chain because each one of these guys down here is getting directly exposed to the toxin. So when the bald eagle eats this fish, he's eating all the toxin that was in every level of the food chain going up right? Because all that toxin is preserved in the, it looks like a salmon here. Uh, so that is biomagnification. Um, oh, one more now here with the human. So the fly is your bait to catch the fish, then the fish or yeah, your, the fly is your bait to catch this fish, then you use this fish to catch this fish that you go home and eat and look how much chemical pollutant you've consumed. This is how, for example, things like mercury uh, travel up in the food chain and sometimes people can get mercury poisoning from eating seafood. Um, that's not because uh, the fish are being directly poisoned with mercury. It's because of, again, this process of biomagnification where there's mercury in the water and um, because all of the plankton and smaller organisms are getting contaminated with mercury, we eat larger fish like tuna that you know can be five or 600 pounds. At that point, that organism, its mercury concentration is going to be so much higher. Why? Because in that environment, the tuna is the apex predator, right? So um, remember, this isn't just a higher concentration in humans, it's higher concentration in all higher level consumers, right? Even like this bass is higher than this bluegill, the bluegill is higher than the mayfly, it gets higher as it goes up, biomagnification. All right, so now we're going to be taking a look at these finches. Um, so you may want to have this diagram pulled up. It's going to be on the next slides, but you want to be able to look at it closely because we're going to be interpreting this diagram. Um, so this is something that would have been covered um, on the regents, like in its own special section. Uh, we would have also done a lab in school. We have already talked about these finches, uh, but it is good to keep this in mind because uh, this is a standard fare uh, for living environment and you would wanna be familiar with this diagram. So uh, this is a sort of famous depiction of different finches and their beak types and uh, the type of food they eat. So you can see out on the outer circle, all the names of the different types of finches. One circle below, drawings of all the different finches. And you may have seen this also with photos of the finches and it shows what their beaks look like. Then this is what their beaks are for. This is the shape of their bills. And then right here in the center is the type of food they eat. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna interpret this diagram to answer the next 12 questions. So 
look at the information in the outside ring of the wheel diagram. Write the names of any five finch species. So I chose the sharp-billed ground finch, the cactus finch, the warbler finch, the woodpecker finch, and the vegetarian finch, but you could have picked any five finch species. And why is it asking you to do that? So that you recognize where the names of all the finches are, because you're going to need those to answer the next questions. Look at the third ring of the wheel diagram. Name the five finches that use edge crushing. So the third ring, one, two, three edge crushing. And we can see here, this is almost the entire side of the circle. We've got the large ground finch, the medium ground finch, small ground finch, the sharp billed ground finch, and the cactus finch all use edge crushing. Do you guys see that? Let me see if I can oop, annotate that for you. Perhaps not. Um, so I won't do this every time because I don't want it to mess up the flow too much, but just so you guys can see what I'm talking about here. Um, yeah, okay. So edge crushing, Ooh, and you can see all of these finch species. Yeah, see, this is why I'm not gonna annotate. Sorry guys, I'm on a laptop. I can't get fancy uh, with an iPad like uh, the other teachers, I apologize. But edge crushing folks, it's there. So what are the five finches that use edge crushing? the large ground finch, the medium ground finch, the small ground finch, the sharp-billed ground finch, and the cactus finch. So now we're going to continue to interpret this diagram. Okay. Look at the third ring of the diagram. Name four finches with biting tips. So again, we're gonna look here. I think I am just gonna draw it again. Um, because I feel like that helps. So we're looking for the biting tips. And you guys can see biting tips extends pretty far. So we have the vegetarian finch, the large tree finch, the small tree finch, and the woodpecker finch. So these are all the different finch species. Um, that have biting tips, and we can interpret that from the drawing. So look at the fourth ring of the diagram. Name three finches with probing bills. So now we're looking at the fourth ring of the diagram, one further in, and we see here the probing bills. So if we go out, it looks like we have the cactus finch, the warbler finch, and the woodpecker finch with probing bills. And now look at the fourth ring of the diagram and name four pit finches with crushing bills. So, ooh, crushing bills. And uh, these are finches that eat mainly plant food. They might have these crushing bills because they're eating seeds, right? And we can think back, uh, these finches occupy different ecological niches, which is why we're speaking about them in ecology. But uh, you also want to think back to unit eight, evolution, and uh, how we got this depiction of the different finch species and how these uh, different physical adaptations uh, influence their ability to survive and reproduce in different environments and produce these morphological differences on these closely related finch species. So, okay, we have the vegetarian finch, the large ground finch, the medium ground finch, and the small ground finch with crushing bills. Uh-oh. Sorry, my screen froze, okay. Look at the inner ring of the diagram. Name three finches that eat mainly animal food. So the inner ring here, mainly animal food. So we can see, see it goes to the woodpecker finch, the small tree finch, and the large tree finch eat mainly animal food. So large tree finch, small tree finch, and woodpecker finch. The word mainly means mostly or 90% of the time. Some finches eat mainly animal food. 
what else can these finches eat? So there's two options here for food, animal food and plant food. So if the finch eats mainly animal food, what is the rest of its diet made up of? Well, by the process of elimination there, folks, I'm gonna say it's plant food. And the example that you may have seen on your handout uh, of plant food is seeds, so such as seeds. Now let's look at the inner ring of the diagram. Name one finch that eats 100% animal food. And you can see here it is only this one finch that eats 100% animal food. So that's the warbler finch. And again, with the process of, of elimination, will a finch that eats 100% animal food also eat plant food? Explain why or why not. Well, no. 100% animal food means 0% plant food. 100% of the diet is animal food. The fact that all these other ones are mainly animal food and this one is distinct, I feel like means something, right? It eats mainly, not just mainly animal food, but only animal food, 100%. Now, will the warbler finch compete with the medium ground finch for food? Support your answer and use the word niche in your answer. The warbler finch and the medium ground finch occupy different niches in the environment. However, the medium ground finch may compete with the warbler finch if plant food was in short supply, as the medium ground finch eats mainly plant food while the warbler finch eats 100% animal food. So the warbler finch is not going to hone in on the medium ground finch's territory. However, if let's say there was some sort of like devastating environmental condition, maybe like the types of conditions that lead to uh, starvation and die off that might uh, impact the forces of evolution, like in an example we read about in our last unit with Peter and Rosemary Grant. Um, and there were these sort of environmental pressures that eliminated all of the plant food available, so there were no more seeds. And then the medium ground finch needed to change its diet uh, to rely more on insects that would maybe be available uh, instead of the seeds. Then the medium ground finch may come compete with the warbler finch, but they occupy two different spaces. So without the environmental pressures to change the finch populations, they likely uh, would not compete. The word mainly means mostly or 90% of the time. Some finches eat mainly plant food. What else can these finches eat? Animal food, such as insects and bugs, right? Those are the two options for food. Plant food, animal food. So if they're not eating animal food, they're eating plant food. If they're not eating plant food, they're eating animal food. All right, so we're gonna follow this example to answer the questions below. Name two finches that will compete for plant food. Support your answer. So again, it's not on this slide, but or it is, it's just very small, but you may wanna look alongside at your diagram as uh, we answer the questions. So name two finches that will complete, compete for plant food and then support your answer. The vegetarian finch and the sharp-billed ground finch will compete for plant food. I know this because they both eat mainly plant food. Name two finches that will compete for animal food. Support your answer. The large tree finch and the small tree finch will complete, compete for animal food. Large tree finch eats 100% animal food and the small tree finch eats mainly, oh, sorry. I think this is an error. The large tree finch eats mainly animal food. Yeah. Let's check the diagram before. Yes, I just made a typo. The answer is still correct. Continue. Yeah, so they both eat mainly animal food. Oh, I just didn't correct this sentence frame, I see. So, okay, the large tree finch and the small tree finch both eat mainly animal food, that's it. Um, I will correct this in the document that I post for you guys. Um, so, name one finch that will compete with the warbler finch for animal food. So the warbler finch, you might remember, is the special finch that eats only, only animal food, 100%. Support your answer. The woodpecker finch and the warbler finch will compete for animal food. The warbler finches eat 100% animal food and woodpecker finches eat mainly plant food, but both finch types have probing bills. Oh, this should say animal food again. Man, I just was obsessed with writing about plant food. I think it's because I use the sentence frame. Forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, I will correct that in the document that I post. But again, we're talking about animal food here and the warbler finch and the woodpecker finch will compete for animal food because they both eat animal food and they have the same type of bill. So theoretically, they would be eating the same types of animals. 
Will the medium ground finch compete for food with the large tree finch? Support your answer. Not typically, as both finch species occupy different niches. The large tree finch lives in trees and eats mainly animal food, and the medium ground finch lives on the ground and eats mainly plant food. So theoretically, an environment could support those two different types of finches in the same place because they would be eating different food sources, they would be occupying different ecological niches. And that is all I have for you all today. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, I hope that was helpful. I hope you guys are thriving and surviving out there during this quarantine. I know it has been rough, um, but I hope you are all well and we miss you. All of your teachers miss you, Mr. Sterling, Ms. Collins, Ms. Ivory, and myself. We really miss you guys. So hope you're doing well. Goodbye.